<laughs> All right, hello again, everybody. This is the San Benito Consolidated Independent School District Board of Trustees regular meeting. It is Tuesday, March 6, 2018, and I call this meeting to order at exactly 6.30 p.m. Roll call, Mr. Mendez. Present. Ms. M.L. Garcia. Present. Ms. Ana Cruz. Mr. Joji Gonzalez. Here. Mr. Orlando Lopez. Present. Mr. Eloy Rosas. Dr. Nate Carmen. Present. And Mr. Tony Torres. All right, we move on to agenda item three, which is the Pledge of Allegiance to the U.S. and Texas flags. I'll turn it over to Ms. M.L. Garcia. Thank you. We have two students from La Encantada Elementary. The one leading the <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance is Mark Gomez. Mark Gomez is 10 years old and is a fifth grader, fifth grade student at La Encantada Elementary. <coughs> he has been a member of La Encantada Student Council for the past three years and currently serves as president. His favorite subject is math because it is, cha it is a challenge and Mark enjoys being challenged and reaching his highest potential. When he grows up, Mark wants to be a scientist because he is curious about how the world works. Another goal is to someday be president of the United States because there is so much conflict in this world and Mark would like to provide us with some solutions. Mark's hobbies include playing football, soccer, and baseball because he enjoys the outdoors and enjoys being part of a team. When he is not playing sports, Mark enjoys reading. Throughout his elementary years, Mark has accomplished many goals. He has scored at the master level of star in reading, math, and writing. Mark has been awarded the Academic Achievement Trophy and the All A Honor Trophy every year since first grade. Mark has also received the Citizenship Trophy because he has been a role model at the campus and is always willing to help out. Mark is the son of Angel and Maria Gomez. He has an older sister, Nadine, who is a sixth grade student at Riverside Middle School. Leading us with the invocation is another student from La Encantada, Victor Hernandez. Victor Hernandez is 10 years old and is a fifth grade student at La Encantada Elementary. Victor has served as the school as the school student council vice president for the past two years. He has been a member of the chess team for the past four years, has participated in spelling bee for several years, and comp competes in track during his summer break. Since first grade, Victor has earned the perfect attendance and the A honor roll awards. He is currently working hard towards his goal of ending the year with a perfect record in both. Victor's awards throughout his elementary years include the Citizenship Award, Student of the Month, and Academic Achievement. His hobbies include bike riding, playing chess, video gaming, and traveling. Victor is a fun, caring student that likes to inspire others to always do their best. When Victor grows up, he wants to be a scientist because he wants to help find a cure for cancer. Victor is the son of Ms. Nora Segura and has a sister, Vanessa, who is a first grade student at La Encantada Elementary. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Please bow your head. Dear Lord, as we start another meeting, we ask that you lead us with guiding light. 
May our leaders be blessed with your wisdom and judgment as they make decisions on the future of the children of San Benito CISD. Help them make each decision with patience, serenity, and wisdom. Lord, we give you thanks for our education, the opportunities, and the friendships we have been blessed with. Continue to bless us as we work hard to achieve our goals. We ask these in your name. Amen. If the parents are in the audience, can they please stand up? Parents, thank you. The principal at uh, La Encantada is Ms. Gracie Martinez. Please, no, you have to stand up too, ma'am. Thank you. Can we have one more round of applause for these awesome students? All right, thank you, Ms. Garcia. We now move on to our next agenda item, which is special recognitions. And I'll turn that over to uh, Mr. Madrigal. Thank you, Mr. Vargas. The month of March marks music in our schools month. So it's quite fitting that tonight we'll be honoring our talented musicians for the accolades, accomplishments, and their fine talents. Besides honoring our musicians, we'll also be recognizing some of our gifted poets and artists. I'd like to begin the special recognition portion of this meeting by first acknowledging our talented artists from all grade levels. These are the artists from throughout our district that are responsible for creating beautiful masterpieces that now adorn our walls at the John F. Barron Administration Building. The public is invited to go see their artwork currently on display at the administration building during normal business hours. Our KSBG and public relations staff members created a video that highlights their artistic work. And after seeing their masterpieces, we know that you'll want to go and check it out for yourselves. I'll start with the elementary campuses. From Dr. Cash Elementary, Jolene Garial, fifth grade. <laughs> Teacher, Maki House. From Dr. Raul Garza, junior elementary, Meredith Ramirez Lopez, second grade. <laughs> Teacher, Christian Rodriguez. From Med Downs Elementary, Keith Lopez, first grade. Teacher Leslie Whitmore. From Frank Roberts Elementary, artist Angela Torres, fourth grade. Teacher Grecia Galvan. From Fred Booth Elementary, Julia Maya, fifth grade. Teacher Natalia Montes. From Judge Oscar de la Fuente Elementary, Kayla Jo Rodriguez, fifth grade. Teacher, Elizabeth Govea. From La Encantada Elementary, Jasmine Lara, fifth grade. Teacher, Luis Cantu. From Landrum Elementary, Chloe Rivera, fifth grade. Teacher Alfonso Gonzalez. From Rangerville Elementary, Victoria Viapando, first grade. Teacher Deborah Kelly. From Sullivan Elementary, Jesus Gaitan, fifth grade. Teacher Jamie R. Luna. We'll now do our middle schools. From Berta Cavaza Middle School, Alondra Martinez, eighth grade. Teacher Sandra Olivares. 
Valeria Herrera, sixth grade. Savannah Parrish, seventh grade. Their teacher is Miriam Cavazos. From Miller Jordan Middle School, Melanie Trevino, sixth grade. Teacher Carla Ambriz. Riley Pastrana, seventh grade. Karen Cardosa, seventh grade. Teacher Releni Munguia. From Riverside Middle School, Alexandra Vasquez, seventh grade. Leonardo Cordova, eighth grade. Andrea Castillo, eighth grade. And their teacher is Diana Villarreal. From uh, Veterans Memorial Academy, Jorge Guzman Torres, ninth grade. Angel Claudio, ninth grade. Orlando Ramirez, ninth grade. And their teacher is Edith Medrano Lopez. From San Benito High School, Raven S. Rios, 10th grade. Giovanna A. Serrata, 11th grade. Brianna J. Rodriguez, 11th grade. And their teacher is Jaime Garcia. Sarah M. Villarreal, 12th grade. Her teacher is Janet Evans. Andres Erebia, 10th grade. Gina Lopez, 11th grade. The teacher is Orlando Ambriz. From Joe Calendret, PRC. Hold on, stop them, stop them. What grade? No. Yes, I'm an art, what grade? What grade? From Joe Calendret, Zane Vasquez, eighth grade. Jose Castillo. Ninth grade, Sean Foster, ninth grade, Jose Vasquez, ninth grade, and Victor Hugo Diaz, tenth grade. Their teacher is Clarissa Ladner. We'd also like to thank our parents of these students. Uh, so now parents of, of these students, would you please take a stand so we can acknowledge you as well. You've just met the artist. Now I'd like to meet, for you to meet our newest poet. These fifth graders were chosen to have their poems published in the 2017 Rising Stars Collection Limited Edition. They're all fifth graders from Fred Booth Elementary, and their reading teacher is Rebecca Hernandez. Their campus principal is Nidia Espinosa. Let's meet these talented poets. 
Melanie Ayala. Luis Cervantes. Marilyn Chapa. Giselle Garcia. Juan Garcia. Jaden Gonzalez. Sofia Hernandez. Julian Lopez. Julissa Morales. Haley Rodriguez. Yaelin Rodriguez. Stephanie Salazar. Alina Torres. Christopher Guerrial. Ana Maria Zuniga. And teacher Rebecca Hernandez. Thank you, parents, for supporting your children and all they do. You've now met our brilliant artists and poets, and next you'll get to meet our outstanding, our outstanding musicians. I'd like to introduce their director of bands. He's somewhere around here. Uh, Daddy Mendoza, who would do our band and music-related honors. It's got to be a while. I want to have a seat. <laughs> First of all, good evening to all the members of our San Benito Board of Trustees, Dr. Carmen, and the directors of our leadership team. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come here this evening. I'm Daire Mendoza, and I'm the director of the instrumental music for San Benito CISD. And today, we have the pleasure of sharing with you and our community the great news of our students' recent accolades and successes by recognizing our students on accomplishments as individual performers. In order to ensure the strength of a program as a whole, we must carefully monitor and develop the strength of each performer. That's why we put a lot of stock into the individual competition of our students. And we're going to begin by acknowledging them uh, this evening, beginning with our middle school students. So from uh, the following list of students uh, earned a chair at this year's uh, TMEA region band tryouts. And one student from Riverside, we have Lorena Vasquez. You come here. Gonna have our students stand over here next to me because it's gonna be quite a few of them, okay? Thank you. And then we're going to move on to Perta Cabasa Middle School, but before we do, uh, we'd like to acknowledge Ms. Lisa Avalos, Manuel Cerda, and Raul Garza, who are the band directors for Riverside Middle School. <laughs> Up next, we have Berta Cabasa and they earned the same chair at the same region tryouts. And we will begin with Janine Farias, Rianne Garcia, April Nino, Ryan Padilla, good. Okay. So, Dave, Ryan Padilla, David Pineda, Daniel Quiroz, <laughs> David Reina, Lauren Saldana, 
Isabela Salazar. And Gabriel Soria. Go ahead and turn around, guys. <laughs> there you are. Directors for the Berta Cavaza Middle School are James Spence, Lauren Espinosa, and David Jimenez. Can we get another round of applause for our Riverside and Berta Cabaza students? Up next, we have a, our Miller Jordan students, who we actually had 12 students make the All Region Band from their campus. And we'll begin with Heavenly Alanis. Stephanie Castillo, Ryan Cavazos, Gabriel Galarza, Armando Garza, Jessica Garza, Cassandra Hinojosa, Christian Morales, Ashton Rodriguez, Naomi Rojas, Osiris Salinas, and Jason Torres. The band directors for Miller Jordan Middle School are Rodolfo Gonzalez and Alejandro Martinez. And one more round of applause for our Miller Jordan students, with high numbers, and their band directors. We have an orchestra department that is very young, but it's already begun to collect their accolades of their own, and we'll begin with our uh, middle school orchestra director, uh, students, excuse me. So from Riverside Middle School, we have Christian Rodriguez. <laughs> Yareli Rodriguez, <laughs> Kathy Rojas, and Israel Valdez. From Miller Jordan, we have two students, Sergio Mendoza and Kevin Viera. From Berta Cavaza, we have Andrea Teran. Also from our orchestra department, we have Sarah Garcia from our high school. Tara Garcia. Juani Villanueva, and Edmundo Vasquez. Orchestra directors for our district are Ms. Karina Vela and Avigay Gonzalez. Right. Another round of applause for our orchestra department. Great job. Just to think a couple of years back, we didn't even have an orchestra department, and we already were collecting accolades from our students. Very proud of them. That's right. We're going to move on to our high school band students, and the next group of students um, audition for our region jazz. Uh, there is a limited number of uh, students that can be in a region jazz band, and we got almost half of the 
of the kids that are able to get chairs into our jazz band camp from San Benito. This is the highest number that we've gotten, and we have 11 chairs that made it. We'll begin with Jimmy and Cecil, all region jazz from the high school. David De La Rosa. Dominic Flores. Ashley Garcia. Robert Garcia. Robert is also the drum major for a marching band. On saxophone, Zeth Lara. Roman Limas. Jose Martinez. Jose is also one of our drum majors for the marching band. Luis Moreno. Santiago Perez. And Edward Trejo. The band directors for our jazz program are Mr. Miguel Aguiar, Jorge Mujica, and Noé Garcia. Our next list of students, we're moving it along. Um, it's a very vast list. And uh, if I can just go ahead and mention the fact that we have almost 50 students make our high school or region band when you combine the ninth to 12th grade. Sometimes when we talk about it, okay, we got 50 students in, okay, so that figures. But sometimes we forget to acknowledge the fact that it wasn't always the case that we got this many students. Not only that, we don't want to sit here and compare ourselves to other programs, but when you do that for the sake of competition, we have to acknowledge the fact that in our whole region 28, there was only one other band that outscored us with a number of chairs in the all-region band. And of course, they have high numbers, high 50s, just like we do. But there is such a thing as another, other bands in our region who earn maybe a handful of chairs. There is such a thing as a band in the region that earns zero chairs at this tryout because it's all the 5As and 6As from Donna all the way to Brownsville. That's a lot of schools. So, we have a large number of students that made it, but that, you know, we just, the only reason we mention it is so that that should not take away from the huge accomplishment that it comes from our students. We're going to start off with the freshman students who made the freshman all-region band, and that is going to be uh, Elisa Aguiar, Oscar Cantú, Alejandro González, Nadeline Jimenez Garza, Matt Linan, Mia Lopez, Gumaro Olvera, Angela Rodriguez, Sean Rodriguez, and Maralisa Zavala. Those are our freshman students who made the freshman all-region band. One more round of applause to our freshman students who represented our region, our band, excuse me, our region. So out of those 50 students that made it, the following are the high school students that made the old region band. And we're starting off with Jimmy and Cecil. Jamal Anderson. Amanda Barrera. Amanda Cárdenas. Mia Cardosa. Ángel Contreras, David De La Rosa, Yasmín Delgado, Dominic Flores, Isaiah Flores, <laughs> he's got a fan club, Ashley Garcia, 
Our drum major, Robert Garcia. Nathan Gomez. Nicholas Gomez. Robert Guzman. Valerie Hernandez. Yamilet Hernandez. Aaron Ibarra. Seth Lara. America Martinez. Daniel Mendiola. Luis Moreno. Christian Parra. Sabrina Pequeño. Tony Quiroz. Emily Ramirez. Ricky Rangel. Matthew Reina. Alejandra Rocío. America Rodríguez. Isaiah Rodriguez, Noah Rodriguez, Mia Satterfield, Elizabeth Sauceda, Zaira Sigala, Aiden Solis, Edward Trejo, Frankie Trujillo, and Eva Villagran. We have quite a few seniors uh, in the, the group of students that made it. We're particularly proud of the seniors that have made the region band for the first time since middle school or high school. So one more round of applause to all our students who made the region band. Congratulations. Different teachers for our students. Our flute teacher is Dulce Rodriguez, Mr. Miguel Aguiar on saxophone, Rafael Garcia on clarinet, Noe Garcia is high brass teacher, Christopher Haynes on low brass, Mr. Jorge Mujica on percussion, and we also have Ms. Leslie Whitmore from one of our elementary schools who comes over and helps us with our horns. Round of applause for the teachers of our students, please. They're doing a fantastic job. Make him smile. We're moving on. Our next contest that we were recognized is the All Region Orchestra. All Region Orchestra is usually uh, designated for our string students, you know, uh, violin, viola, cello, and bass. However, we have a symphony orchestra that we try out for once a year, and we actually allot some chairs for some of the wind and percussion instruments to try out. It's extremely difficult to get some of those because for example, one of our players, they only accept one. Out of all the high schools in the Region 28, only one student on piccolo can get in. Only about four percussionists, two flutes are allowed to be in there. So it's a very difficult task just to get in there. So we acknowledge the students who made the All Region Orchestra on wind and percussion. Uh, we have three, and they are Mia Cardosa, Ricky Rangel, and Crystal Salazar. Mia and Ricky are percussion students, and Crystal is a piccolo player. Congratulations once again to our all region students. The teachers of these particular students are for for Crystal is our flute teacher, Ms. Dulce Rodriguez, and the percussion teacher is Mr. Jorge Mujica. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on. The following group of students are, we compete at the region level on a solo and ensemble contest, and we take our students to participate in solos or ensembles. If they receive a first division rating from their judge, then they allow the opportunity for them to compete at the next level, which would be the state level at UT Austin, which happens in late May. 
Uh, this tryout happened last month in February, and the following group of students earned a first division medal on their solo and will be advanced into the state competition in May. And we had one orchestra student who made it. It's very special to acknowledge this because this is the first student that we have from our orchestra program to advance to the state level, and we're very proud of her. This is Tara Garcia. Tara is a violin player from our high school orchestra department. Ms. Karina Vela and Abigail Gonzalez are the orchestra teachers. Congratulations, Tara. Moving on to our guitar department, we're very fortunate to have a guitar department, a very well-developed guitar department here at San Benito High School and with our middle schools as well. And they also get to compete at the UIL level. And the following list of students earned a first division on either a trio or a solo, so they'll be advancing to the state level competition just like the band students and orchestra students. And we'll begin with Brisa Araiza, Elisa Duran, Josiah Gonzalez, Kayla Garcia, Gabriel Garza, Amanda Garcia, Eliazar Garcia, Isaiah Guajardo, Hector Hernandez, Connie Martinez, George Morin, Luis Polanco, Samantha Ramirez, Journey Torres, Michael Torres, and Leslie Vega. The teachers for our guitar department for our VMA in high school, Alberto Ortiz and Jorge Mascorro. Congratulations once again to our guitar students who are advancing to Austin. We're continuing with the band students advancing to Austin. And we're trying to move it along. We're starting off uh, with, a, these are our state solo and ensemble gold medal winners who will be advancing to Austin. This is from the band department, Jimmy and Cecil, Jamal Anderson, Amanda Barrera, Vanessa Barrera, Noe Barrientos, Juan Cano, Mia Cardosa, Hannah Cavazos, Zane Cavazos, Ángel Contreras, Sarah Cordova, David De La Rosa, Matthew Delgado, Isaiah Flores, Marquez Galván, Ashley Garcia, Carlos Garcia, Luis Garcia, Michael Garcia, and Robert Garcia. Nathan Gomez, Nicholas Gomez, Alexis Gonzalez, Valerie Hernandez, Aaron Ibarra, Joaquin Islas, Nadeline Jimenez Garza, Zeth Lara, Roman Limas, Caleb Longoria, Matthew Lugo, Jose Martinez, Luis Moreno, Joseph Muñoz, Armando Núñez, Julio Olivares, Santiago Perez, Alex Quiroz, Tony Quiroz, Ricky Rangel, Robert Resendez, Matthew Reina, Alejandra Rocio, Angela Rodriguez, Isaiah Rodriguez, 
Noah Rodriguez, Sean Rodriguez. Michael Salas, Crystal Salazar, Mia Satterfield, Elizabeth Sauceda, Zaira Sigala, Aiden Solis, Edward Trejo, Frankie Trujillo, Joanna Villarreal, and Alex Zavala. The teachers of all the students who will be competing at the state level are flute, Dulce Rodriguez, saxophone teachers, Miguel Aguilar, Rafael Garcia and clarinet, Noe Garcia on high brass, Christopher Haynes on low brass, Mr. George Mojica on percussion, and Ms. Leslie Whitmore for horn. Congratulations to all our students going to Austin. We're almost done. <laughs> The following group of students that we have to recognize are only four of them, and then we'll be done. It is, uh, the following group of students all earned a TMEA chair and the TMEA All-State Band this year. It's a huge honor. In fact, it is the highest achievable honor by a high school student, a high school musician, that is, because less than 2% of the total population of the state of Texas is able to actually make this great honor, and we have four of our students that made the All-State Band. We're extremely proud of them. On trumpet, we'll begin with Ashley Garcia on trumpet. Nathan Gomez on euphonium. We're not as good as research as some of our students are, but Mr. Gomez went online and he researched and researched and he realized that he was actually the first euphonium player from our school district since the existence of our school district to ever make the All-State Band on euphonium. Congratulations to him. <laughs> Zeth Lara, an alto saxophone. We've had sexes before, but it's important to mention that Mr. Seth Lara scored sixth chair, meaning that he is the sixth highest ranking saxophonist in the state of Texas. So congratulations to Seth. We have Elizabeth Salceda on flute, who is a junior. Congratulations to her. The teachers for these particular students are Noe Garcia on trumpet, Christopher Haynes on low brass, Miguel Aguiar on saxophone, and Ms. Dulce Rodriguez is the flute teacher. Congratulations to our students and their teachers. Since we're acknowledging the students and their accolades, uh, with your permission, I'd like to take this time and opportunity to also acknowledge the parents. Antes los abuelos nos decían, la educación comienza en la casa. Education begins at home. And we want to take this time to recognize the parents of all these students for the wonderful job they're doing with the future of our community. So congratulations to you, parents. We also want to take this opportunity to thank you, our school board of trustees, and the directors of our program and the teachers of our program, because we know it is a deep belief of our instrumental music department that the success of our program begins and ends with the hard work and dedication of our students. But we also recognize that so much of it would just simply not be possible if it were not for the continued support of our district, our school board of trustees, and our community. So thank you so much for the time and the effort you put into the talent of our students. Mr. Mendoza, before you end, can you, can you actually have all your staff come up as well, just so they can be recognized? Yes, can we have all the staff come up and be recognized, please, all the teachers from the various students?
Thank you so much. We look forward to our May meeting where we can recognize the students on their group accomplishments coming up. Thank you so much for your time. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mendoza. That was certainly great to see all those students and their accolades. Uh, we now move on to our superintendent's report. I will turn it over to Dr. Carmen. All right, thank you, Mr. Vargas. At this time, we'll start with the uh, superintendent's report. The uh, first item <clears throat> is to report on a statement of impact from Texas Education Agency regarding charter school. This one is IDEA Public Charter School. Um, we've been informed that IDEA Public Schools plans to um, expand their services. And if you look at the uh, campuses they're discussing and the geographic boundaries they're, they're discussing, they are not looking at expanding anything directly in Cameron County, uh, nor specifically in San Benito, but the potential from area schools to, uh, to pull students is still there. Um, they're looking to expand the ge geographic boundaries. There's a list there. The campuses they are looking at adding for the 2019-20 school year, um, a pre-K-5, San Antonio number five, IDEA, Brownsville four, in South McAllen, a pre-K-5 and 612 college prep in Jaeger, a health professions uh, academy in Austin, another campus in El Paso, another campus in Tarrant County that will draw from multiple counties, and another one in, in Tarrant County that will draw from multiple counties. Um, and again, the, um, the potential impact here is just the, uh, the change in enrollment. Any questions? Okay, I guess we can move on to your next item. Thank you, sir. The uh, number two under the superintendent report is our TASB staffing review. And I believe we have Mr. Zach Hobbs here from TASB who is going to, uh, to go over some highlights from that review that TASB has completed for us. Thank you, good evening, Dr. Carmen, board of trustees. I appreciate you guys taking time in the meeting to allow me to present our findings and options from the staffing review that TASB conducted for San Benito CISD. Um, you know, as a former teacher and principal, uh, I enjoy seeing the student recognition. It, it reminds me of, of why I still support public schools. So, and thank you guys for, for doing the same thing. Hopefully I can get this thing to work here and everything will go smooth. All right, great. So I'm going to start out just by giving an overview of, of the process that, that uh, we went through when we conducted the review. First off, we collected data, and that entailed uh, uh, conducting site interviews with district administrators and also campus principals, um, collecting some uh, personnel data from the district and student enrollment data and class counts and things of that nature. From there, we conducted our analysis, and that began with a, a peer analysis or a peer comparison. How does San Benito CISD compare to peer districts that are comparable to them? And we looked at districts that um, were similar in, in student enrollment and demographics. Uh, we also applied benchmarks to specific jobs, and, and I'll go through some of those here in a minute. Um, but that was also part of the, the comparison analysis as well. And then finally, we built models for improvement. And so this entailed aligning the different positions with the benchmarks that we have um, for those specific positions and also attempting to address any needs that were determined during the interviews and the data collection process. So 
So I want to give a little background about benchmarking and, and what that means, because I think it helps understand what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, the objective of applying benchmarking concepts is to drive towards the identification and implementation of best practices. And so why would you benchmark? Well, I'm going to give you three reasons why. One is it allows you to, to take a good look at yourself. Two, it allows you to look and see what others are accomplishing. And then three, it, it helps you prioritize your efforts. And so that's the goal of, of what we're trying to provide for the district here is to see where San Benito uh, CISD aligns with benchmarks and then to help you have a roadmap to prioritize your efforts and, and make adjustments as needed from there. Um, but just remember, this is, this is based on benchmarks. It doesn't necessarily mean that there, that changes have to be made, but there's opportunities for you um, if you feel like you need to make some changes. So what benchmarks were used in, in the analysis? Well, we use PEAMS data to, uh, to look at comparisons with other districts, and we can pull that data from TEA. Uh, we also use uh, standards from associations, um, Association of Physical Plan Administrators, Counselors Associations, Nurses Associations, things of that nature. And then we also um, just pull from our resources at TASB uh, the many years of uh, staffing reviews we've conducted, the data we have from those reviews, and also we utilize our TASB um, salary survey data that includes FTE. So we can use that information as well for comparison purposes. So let's talk about the summary and findings uh, that, that we found during our analysis. I'm going to begin with the administrative and professional instructional support staff. Um, and I'm going to start with central administration. Uh, when we looked at central administration, it, it's difficult to really compare apples to apples when you're comparing central administration with other districts. And the reason being is because districts will uh, staff central administration in different ways. The, they have a different hierarchy, different organization chart, and the way they may uh, organize some of their staff. Um, but we do use some of our benchmark data from the salary survey to provide a comparison there. And, and when we did that, and uh, we found that San Benito CISD is above some of the peers in the areas of curriculum instruction, business finance, and operations. And so our, our recommendation would be to just look at those programs, evaluate the duties, make sure that, that um, everything is working in order there, and, and if needed, then, then make some adjustments. In your principal Mr. staff. Hobbs, Mr. Hobbs, are, are you saying that we're up to par with the, with the needs on those areas? Uh, uh, come, Compared to your peers, you're slightly above your peer districts in, in the areas of curriculum and instruction, business and operations. Um, it's not drastic by any means, but it is, you're slightly above your peers on average in those, in those areas. Now, when I, when I say that, you know, we're looking at several peer districts. There's some peer districts that are staffed above you. There's some districts that are staffed below. But when we average out those peers, then San Benito is slightly above in those areas. Okay, and we're talking about administration, correct? Th this would be your, your professional staff. Okay. Um, you know, and when we, when we dug into it a little bit deeper, it, it appeared that it may be, and like I was saying at the beginning, it's difficult to compare apples to apples here. Some of it may be uh, levels and titles. It, it seems like the, that the district had a lot of director level positions, whereas other di di districts had coordinator level positions. And so that there could be some anomalies there just based on titles and maybe the level of those positions. Okay. Thank you. Good question. And please, uh, if you have questions, you guys stop me. Thank you. Um, so the next group is the principals. Uh, the option we're providing is to consider reducing the interim DAEP principal position for, for some cost savings. Um, what is DAEP principal? Uh, that your DAEP is your okay. disciplinary alternative okay. education program. Appreciate that. And so Thank there's you. an interim principal in there right now. Thank you. Do away with this principalship. Is that is this what you're suggesting? Yes, uh, absorbing that position. Yes, ma'am. 
would, and so when when we t- when I say reduce or absorb, I, I'm talking about through attrition. So this would be if the person leaves or the position that becomes available. Yes, ma'am. It, it would be not replacing that position. Okay. No. Yes, re- okay. Yeah. Excuse me. When did you do this study? Uh, we started in February. So at February, I believe February first and second was when we started the, the we conducted the interviews. And so we've been working on it since the beginning of February, and we, we just completed it a, a, a few weeks ago. So, two then, days? Two days? Is that what you're saying, that you did two days? Of no, t- two days of interviews. Only? Yes, ma'am. But, uh, I mean, it was all day long visiting with uh, multiple people. I mean, we, we interviewed, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I, we interviewed close to 20 people, I believe. In two days? Yes, ma'am. It's, it's what we do all the time on the staffing reviews. We, we uh, visit with district administration and the campus principals. I have a follow-up question on this, oh, on this one. Can, um, can I address the first over here, first of all? I'm, I'm not sure that you got the full methodology across to them. Prior, prior to the interviews, um, TASB requests all of, our, all of our data by campus, by department, so number of students, number of teachers, number of classroom pairs, um, so the face-to-face interviews are, are a small part of it. Uh, the vast majority of their work, I don't want to speak on your behalf, Mr. House, but the vast majority no. of their work is just based, based on the files that we sent them. Um, it, it's weeks of analyzing numbers and looking at, looking at averages. So and two-day I, I interviews can, are, I can, are one thing. I can add to that. You know, prior to the interviews, we sent questionnaires to the staff that had several questions for them to answer. And then we received those questionnaires back before we came for the interviews. So the interviews uh, were a way for us to kind of dig in deeper from the questionnaires and really get a feel from the staff about any concerns they had on, the, on their staff and on, on staffing allocations. And you got all the questions back and everything. For, uh, everything you gave out, you, you received back. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We, we sent the questionnaires in January before we came out received everything back before we even came for the interviews. That, that's typically how we do it, because it gives us an idea of what questions, further questions we might want to ask during the interview process. Okay, um, I'm looking out right now, and I see some shaking of heads. Okay. So, I w- but this is just suggestions. This is, I'm sorry, are you asking me a question? Is this yes, is this just suggestions that yes, we do? Yes, the, the, all yes, these, all these are, is, these are options available for the district for that are aligning you with benchmarks. Okay. That, that's it, and that's why I explained benchmarks earlier. These, again, let me say that. Th- yeah, these, are, I, I, these are options that are available for the district that would okay. align you with the benchmarks. Okay. That doesn't mean that the district needs to go out and okay. adopt all these things. Okay. The district right. will need to determine if if you're not aligned with the benchmark, there, maybe you have a reason. Maybe you have a district initiative that you want to address and you want to okay. staff that a different way. And that's okay. Okay, yeah, Ms. Garcia, uh, really okay. quick. With previous studies we've done, whether they've been staffing or even our compensation plan in the past, we haven't adopted, I think in 2014, we didn't adopt the compensation plan then. There were just recommendations. When we went back and did the whole compensation plan again, we adopted parts of it. And so these are just recommendations done by TASB so they can professionally give this their recommendations. And we will decide what best to decide. Okay, I, I was just a little confused. This is my first time here and oh, that's okay. I'm a little confused. I'm, I'm, I'm that's glad why I'm asking. asking. Yes, ma'am. Good, okay. good question. I want you to ask questions. Okay. No, the, these are options. The, okay. These are options for the district. I don't even like to use the word recommendation. They're, okay. they're options. All right. Thank you yes. very much. No um, problem. My, my follow-up question, Mr. Hobbs, is this, and I, and I was perusing through the uh, PowerPoint, but I don't see any solutions or recommendations by the by TASB to uh, uh, perhaps forgo the, the reduction and appropriate the right person or the right over, uh, uh, personnel over the, uh, the ones that we're, you're anticipating on cutting or removing. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, or, or do you all not provide us with a, sol- with a possible solution or alternative to, the, to your recommendation? I'm not sure I understand. You're saying someone over? The- For example, you have, uh, and I'll, I'll go with this one, consider reducing the interim DAP principal position. Mm-hmm. Okay. What would be your possible solution for that? Is when that position, 
resigns, retires, terminates. Right. Goes Assuming under, that we go in your you direction, fill, what you would don't be fill your... the position. That's, right. That's how how the the that's how that would work. When the position leaves the district, you just would not fill that position. The the duties would be absorbed from other staff. Okay. Um, right, let, let, so, me, let me elaborate on that. Mr. Mr. Hobbs wasn't the person who actually conducted the interviews. His his, uh, his teammate did, Karen Dooley. And in that verbal conversation, her, the recommendation would be we absorb it, and that the principal we have at Gateway would be able to oversee both campuses. That that that's the recommendation. Th thank you. Yes, sir. appreciate that. Sorry, he, he's kind of pinch hitting tonight. Thank you. Yes, uh, and, <laughs> yeah, and I, I I don't have all the specific details on some of this. As, <laughs> as Dr. Carmen said, you know. Uh, Karen Dooley, it, she had to be in another district tonight, and so. And uh, I completely uh, understand, Mr. House, but uh, you know, when 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 uh, concerns or recommendations are given to us, I also would like some solutions as well. That's why. I understand. <laughs> but thank no. you, Mr. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Carmen. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so the next next group, I'm kind of working through administration here. So campus administration assistant principals, um, the option available is to reduce through redirection up to nine assistant principals. So when I say redirection, this would be reallocating those staff uh, to some other areas. And I'm gonna talk about those other areas in a minute. Um, I'll, I'll point it out right now, but it would be in instructional support areas, instructional coaches, coordinators, and that type of role. So what's causing this is we're seeing that the district has more assistant principals than the benchmark. The benchmark we use for assistant principals is one assistant principal for 450 students. And so the, the district is, is slightly above that. So there's the opportunity to take nine assistant principals, redirect them to provide some support in some other areas if you wanted to be aligned with the benchmark in, at the assistant principal. How many students? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. One assistant principal per 450 students, 450. And so I'll talk about the instructional coordinators and coaches here in a minute. Counselors. Uh, the option available for the counselors is to redirect one counselor position. For counselors, we use a benchmark of one counselor for 350 students at the secondary level, and then one counselor for 450 students at the elementary level. Uh, the position where we're seeing this is at, is at San Benito High School. So San Benito High School is um, currently staffed below the benchmark level by one position. However, you're going to be able to gain a, a counselor with the, the re-coordination of your campuses. Um, you have a, an elementary campus that's going to be closing down, and so right. you're going to have an additional counselor position available from that campus. You could reallocate that position to San Benito High School uh, and then be at the benchmark level at all campuses. Okay. Instructional coaches. So I mentioned this a little bit with assistant principals. You know, the, the addition of academic or instructional coaches and coordinators in the districts, is, it's a growing trend right now. There is a lot of uh, studies and research that have been conducted that show that this is the number one reason why teachers either leave the profession or stay in the profession during their first few years. They, the number one reason for staying in the profession is that they had a mentor or a coach that was there to support them with their instruction. The number one reason for leaving the profession was that they had no support. So we're seeing districts trying to add these in as funds allow. And so you guys have an opportunity if you wanted to do this with those uh, assistant principal positions where you're above the benchmark level. So I mentioned you had nine assistant principal positions. You could reallocate those nine positions to instructional support positions, instructional coaches, instruct instructional coordinators. And uh, from there, you would just need to add two more positions in order to be able to, to reach the, the option here of four instructional coordinator positions and seven instructional coaches to be able to support your campuses sufficiently. Those two additional positions uh, above the nine reallocations, those could be covered with funds you're, you're currently using. So currently you have some lead teachers that are getting a stipend to provide that instructional support. However, they're also full-time teachers and so that, that's a difficult task for them and they're not fully available to, to maybe meet the needs of all the teachers. So you could 
have them dedicate their time to teaching, use those stipends to help pay for those two additional positions. So you're not looking at any increase in funds there. Mr. Hobbs, in, in relation to librarians, um, was there, in your analyses, librarians versus instructional media specialists, which is what I think they're being called, is, can you talk about that or is yeah. that not in your purview? No, no, it's a, a great question. Uh, we're seeing that a lot. And so on the librarians, uh, to address your question is, the, uh, what we're seeing districts do now is, as their librarians are retiring or leaving, they're replacing those with media specialists and trying to move that direction and, and change the focus of their library. And so that's something, if, if that's a direction the district wants to go, that'd be, that's a great option. So as libraries leave, you replace them with media specialists and you can transform that. So I guess my question, my question becomes if we are not gonna have an exodus of librarians, can we train them? I guess it's a question for Dr. Carmen. Uh, to become media, uh, instructional media specialists. Sure, yeah, but there's, there's no reason why you could not provide that training for them to, to do that, exactly right. Thank the, you. The, the option that you'd have available through the attrition piece is you wouldn't necessarily have to hire a certified librarian, and so there, there's that. It kind of opens it up a little bit more for, for your hiring and your applicant pool, but good question. Uh, so on the librarians, the, the option we saw was the, to be able to reduce one librarian at the elementary level, um, and that's due to the, the one campus. You're moving from 12 campuses down to 11. And then um, also there are four library aides that you could consider using in other instructional roles, uh, instructional support roles that are at the secondary campuses. So your secondary campuses have a library aid uh, along with the librarian. And so if, if the need is not for that library aid there, but you could use those positions in more of an instructional support role in the classroom, you could transfer those over there. Clinic staff. Uh, for uh, clinic staff, we look at the Nurses Association recommendations, um, and, and they, have, they talk about some numbers of close to 750 students based on the type of population. So it can, it can vary a little bit, but they, what they really say is every student should have direct access to a nurse. And so we interpret that as you ought to have a school nurse on every campus, uh, which San Benito CISD does. Uh, currently the district has 13 registered nurses, five LVNs and two clinic aides. Texas Administrative Code says that the nursing duties in a school district should be or fall underneath the responsibilities of a registered nurse and RN. So districts should at least have one RN uh, within the district. With a district this size, you would wanna have several RNs. Um, however, you guys have quite a few. You've got 13 RNs. If there's some cost savings needed, you could transfer over to more LVNs and fewer RNs and still be able to provide um, a great service to your students. And so that was one thing we, we presented in the alternative clinic model is moving to more of a balanced approach of nine RNs, nine LVNs, and keeping those two clinic aides. Uh, and so your RNs would oversee an LVN. You would have one RN for each LVN to be able to supervise them and help out if needed. So. It's a way to continue to provide good service, but maybe also provide cost saving or transfer that money somewhere else if needed. Um, we're seeing a lot of districts try to do that if, if, if they have to. Clerical paraprofessional staff. Uh, so this is gonna be um, clerical staff that are working in the offices, both at the campus and the administrative level. Um, and then we'll talk about instructional aids here in a second as well. But let's, let's start at the campus level. At the campus level, what we're seeing here is that uh, San Benito High School and Veterans Memorial Academy are both above the benchmark level by four positions. And then Miller Jordan Middle School is also above the benchmark level by one position. Um, there would be two elementary clerical positions become available that could be uh, utilized somewhere as well. Um, However, if you look at all that 
in aggregate, you're, you're showing that the district is 11 positions above the benchmark. So you've got 11 positions in campus clerical that, that could be either absorbed or reallocated to another use somewhere. On the non-campus clerical or non-campus support staff, this is gonna be at Central, Central Administration, your clerical support staff at Central Administration. Um, based on the benchmark, uh, the district is uh, about four, uh, 15 positions above the benchmark level. So again, there's some room here for absorption of staff or reallocation of staff to help in other areas. One place that we, we saw a need, and we'll talk a little bit about this uh, again in a second, is in technology. So redirecting one of these positions to a help desk uh, technician top position would be beneficial in technology. Instructional aides fall under this group as well, the clerical paraprofessional. Looking at the instructional aides, and, and we're just talking about general education right now, we'll talk about special education in a minute. Uh, the elementary campuses are about 17 positions above the benchmark level, and, and uh, you know, the, the reconfiguration of your elementary campuses obviously is going to affect some of these things. Um, but the, the option is available to absorb the attrition up to 12 instructional aid positions at the elementary campuses. Special education staff. So we, in special education, we're gonna, first gonna focus on the aides and the teachers. And uh, what we do with special education, first uh, let me clarify that, that Texas rule leaves determination of staffing special education up to the local district. So it's up to the district to determine how they want to staff special education, but you must meet the, the um, educational requirements of the student. Um, we have developed some, and I say we, TASB has developed some guidelines for ratios in the classroom based on a weighted caseload method that involves the severity of the child in specific instructional settings and different campus levels. And so what we're gonna do is we apply that ratio to your instructional settings and campus ratios and then just show how far you are off of that ratio. It gives you some ideas of where you could dig in and evaluate a little bit deeper if, if you're far off of that ratio. Sir. Yes. Are you talking about 26 district-wide? Yes, ma'am. District-wide? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Yes, it is, that is district-wide. So when we take our ratios that we developed the, with the weighted caseload, and again, what that means is a least severe setting is going to have a higher class ratio than a more severe setting, obviously. And then a lower level elementary school setting is going to have a lower class ratio than a high school setting. And so we, we're going to apply those, those ratios to those different settings. Sir, um I know you don't have that data to break that down for us at this moment, do you? As far as how, where we're at right now with the severity of the situation as far as where the aids are, yes, are connected I, to? I can, I can tell you the campus level and the instructional setting. If that, is that what you're asking? Well, yeah, yeah it'll, it'll help us out to figure out sure. or just to, to follow sure. you on that. Thank you. You got it. And, um, and, and you know, we've provided this detail to administration, but uh, at the high school level, we're showing 11 at the, at the high school level. Uh, nine th that were in the life skills setting, which is a self-contained setting, that's gonna be your more severe students, and two in a behavior unit. At the middle school level, we're showing six across the middle school campuses, five were in the life skills setting, and one in the behavior unit. At the elementary campuses, we were showing nine across the elementary campuses. Three were in the resource setting, which is the least restrictive environment. Three in the, the PPCD setting, which is gonna be your, your very young three, three and four year olds. Two in the life skills setting and one in the behavior unit. Looking at your special education teachers and we apply that same methodology here as well. We're showing the, the option to be able to absorb up to two special education teachers through attrition 
to align with those, those staffing allocations. Um, and the way that broke down was there was two at the San Benito High School in the resource instructional setting and one at uh, Veterans Memorial Academy in the resource setting and then one at Miller Jordan Middle School in the resource setting. However, you're going to gain a couple staff from two elementary campuses that you could reallocate to two of those positions. So it netted out to, to two positions overall. Also in special education, we look at your assessment staff. And so this includes your diagnosticians and LSSPs. Uh, we use a, a weighted caseload here and the uh, the caseload benchmark for LSSPs and diagnosticians is 80 to 85 students per uh, personnel unit. Uh, San Benito CISD currently has a caseload of 116.7, so you're quite a bit uh, above that 80 to 85 benchmark range. So the, the option is to consider the addition of three LSSPs to bring your caseload average down to approximately 80.2, and it would get you within that that range of 80 to 85. And then same thing with speech services, we look at your speech language pathologist and, and your assistants. Uh, the benchmark range here is 45 to 50 speech students per service provider. Currently, San Benito CISD has a caseload of 57.1 on average for their uh, speech service providers. The addition of two speech language pathologists would bring that caseload down to 46.7, which would be within the, the range of, of 45 to 50. Mr. Charles, let me say, ask you to about your math for a second. Um, you're weighting the value of our assessment staff and of our speech paths. Um, and so 80% of the time, I guess, you're, you're weighting toward assessment. For our current LSSPs, when you add up 70% of our diags, you come up to 6.6. .6. But if we add three LSSPs, we're only going to yield 80% of their time. So wouldn't that just take us to nine even instead of 9.6? Yes, I think you're right there. You're right there. We, we would need to make an adjustment there. Um, so what Dr. Carmen's saying is uh, for LSSPs and diagnosticians, they cannot give 100% of their time to educational assessments. They have other duties as well. And so with through our questioning and interviewing process, we determine how much time they devote to assessments and we wait them for that time. And so with that, and same thing with the speech pathologist, they can't devote 100% of their time to um, providing speech services because they have other duties as well uh, in, in taking care of paperwork and things of that nature. And so I think we may be a little off on the math there. We'll go back and correct that because if we're adding a personnel unit, it's not a full one unit. It's going to be a weighted unit. And so we, we might be off. So it may be that instead of two speech language pathologists, you may need three to get there because of the weighting. So good catch. Thank you. Did that make sense to everyone? Everybody okay there? All right, teachers. We're going to start at the elementary campuses. Um, at the elementary level, we um, go off the guideline of 22 to 1 per classroom. That, that's the, what, what's set by the state, and if you're above the 22 to 1, you have to file a waiver currently. Uh, so if we apply that 22 to 1 ratio across your elementary campuses, we're showing that San Benito CISD may be able to absorb up to 10 elementary teachers next school year. And this is based on rolling each grade level forward and, and projecting enrollment on, on, what, on our best guess of what we think might happen there. Um, so we're looking at, again, the opportunity to absorb up to 10 elementary teachers through attrition for next school year. Just a One, qu question and clarification on, on yes. the elementary teachers. Um, the data that you obtain for elementary teachers, did you go based on certifications that we have at HR or, or an active count of teachers that are actually sitting in the classroom uh, and doing the instruction? It's, it's the active count of teachers sitting in the classroom. So we're looking at the, the staffing unit that you have there. Okay, thank you. Yep. And so to continue on with elementary teachers, one thing that, that uh, was noticed was there's 
uh, a reading intervention teacher at each elementary school. However, there's not much intervention available for math, and there was a need addressed there. So you could take those 10 elementary teachers that could possibly be absorbed next year, redirect them to provide some math intervention for the elementary uh, campuses. If you take those 10, you could put one on each campus with the exception of one campus. So then the, the next opportunity there would be to add one more intervention teacher so you'd have a math intervention teacher on each campus. Um, so that, that's one opportunity or one option to think about with that, those additional elementary teachers for next year. For your middle school campuses, uh, unfortunately, secondary campuses are not quite as easy as elementary. And the reason being is because a teacher is going to see multiple students throughout the day as they change classes. They're not just looking at a class of, of 22 students or below for the, the, the entire day. Their class average changes. And uh, so we have to do a lot of math here. We have to look at the master schedules and, and dig in. And when we do this, uh, we come up with an, an overall class average for the campuses, and then we compare that to benchmark ranges of what we're seeing across the state. Uh, currently, we're seeing class averages anywhere from 22 to 24 at the middle school level across the state. And uh, if we look at your middle schools, to get you to that lower end of that range of 22, you could absorb up to seven teachers overall across the middle school campuses through attrition. Uh, currently, you're, you're setting below that, that 22 mark. You're, the middle school campuses are somewhere around 20.8 uh, at a class average overall. Also at the middle school campuses, when we're looking at the, the uh, master schedules and looking at class counts, one thing we noticed was in athletics is that uh, the student ratio was quite a bit lower than what we were seeing in the other classes. And so the, the opportunity to get those in line and provide some more academic classes during the school day are available. Um, you could convert three athletic assignments to academic assignments at Jordan Middle School. Um, and then uh, we also presented the opportunity of pro providing some support in there with some instructional aids. You've got some additional instructional aids that you could reallocate over there to provide support if needed. Uh, but what this means is at Jordan Middle School, you could take three coaches that are in an athletics period and have them teach an additional academic class. So if, let's say they're a math teacher coach. Um, they, they could teach a math class during that athletic period and it's just going to raise your athletic average slightly and, and provide some more academic classes, but also get that athletic average more in line with your other classes. Auxiliary staff. First, we're going to look at your custodial staff. For custodial, we follow some guidelines by the, the Association of School Business Officials. Now these guidelines do not take into account the condition of the buildings, equipment being used, uh, duty schedules, or anything of that nature. So these are, are just um, kind of middle of the road guidelines. If, if you want to dig into that, there's, there's some other services out there that you would have to look into, but this will at least give you an idea if you need to pursue some other options or not. Uh, but, but ASBO recommends one custodian per 19,000 adjusted square foot on average. If we apply that uh, to San Benito ISD, you guys are staffed really well. What we were seeing, though, is you just need to reallocate some staff and level some staff uh, across some of the campuses. Um, you were off the, that benchmark on some campuses, um, above on some campuses, below on some campuses. And so just looking at that and, and uh, leveling that out. On the maintenance staff, we use the Association of Physical Plant Administrators guidelines, and so they have guidelines for uh, specific skilled labor positions. They have guidelines for the number of acres that you maintained and square footage maintained uh, on the campuses. When we apply those standards across the board, we see that there's opportunity to absorb up to eight maintenance positions through attrition overall. Um, the other thing that we uh, saw was it looks like the district is 
below the standards in some specific areas, and that was in the plumbing area and the electrical area. And so one thing to, to think about in the future is, do we need to add some, some plumbers or electricians? Um, and you, know, you can look at your contracted services and things of that nature to help guide some of that decision making, um, but you were below in those two areas. Technology. Um, from, from what I read and heard, you guys have a very aggressive technology plan, and so I, I commend you for that. Um, the unfortunate thing is that uh, there's not any guidelines out there for public school technology. So uh, what, what we do is we do look at how you, you stack up to your peer districts as far as staffing technology. That can't, that's not necessarily a great option either because they may have a different technology plan than San Benito does. Um, so what we recommend is trying to come up with a standard for your technology staff, either based on devices supported or users supported, and then following that standard and, and reevaluating on a regular basis and making sure you're meeting the needs of the district. Um, the one thing that we did provide, though, if you remember earlier, you have some additional non-campus support staff. Reallocating one of those positions to serve as a help desk technician, I think would be a good move for the district and the technology area. Security services. Again, security services is one of those things where there's no guidelines out there and uh, we see different things at, at different districts. Some of that depends on if they have an in-house police department or if they work with the, the local police department. The size of the district is also um, obviously uh, something that can cause some variances. Um, what we were seeing though is that w when you compare San Benito to some of the peer districts, that San Benito is staffed uh, quite a bit heavier than the peer districts. And so just evaluation of that department and looking at some of those levels where you're off the peer districts and determining if changes are needed would be recommended. And then last but not least, um, and I, I know this is small, but uh, I, I just wanted to, to point out that we do apply cost savings or expense for these positions to, to give you an idea of how that's gonna impact the bottom line. If you address some of these options, you know, what kind of expense is that gonna be added to the district or what kind of savings is that gonna be for the district where we could use those funds somewhere else? Um, so, you, so it provides the FTEs where, where we were showing for the options and then just an average salary for that position. And again, remember the, the goal is, is for this to provide you guys with the roadmap going forward, um, seeing where you're off of benchmarks and then, and then reevaluating if you need to make some adjustments in those areas. Any questions? No more questions? Thank you, Mr. Hobbs. You guys, we thank appreciate you guys. It. Thanks, Dr. Carmen. All right, I think we move on to Ms. Hilda Rendon. You're in the spotlight, man. Good evening, Mr. Board President, Dr. Carmen, members of the board and, and audience. Tonight I'm giving the presentation, or, or wait. Can, sorry about that, I can't tiptoe. Now I messed it up. Okay, starting off with the cash report. This is for the month ending February 2018. We're going to start off with the cash balances. The total balance ending for the month of February 28, 2018 is $51,472,386.26. Of that, we have $39,226,000. $39,226,901.14 
invested in our public funds. Our student activity accounts. The student activity accounts have an ending balance of $431,000. $126.68. January's balances is also presented as a comparison. The other one is the owners of these accounts. And we're going to go off into the comparison of the revenue to the budget. Starting off with, this is the, the comparison of the revenue to the budget. So in the revenues, the first section is our general operating funds. What we have realized through February 28th is $65,728,196.88. In anticipated, we have a budget of $117,248,648. We have realized 56.6% of the anticipated revenue. The middle section is our special revenue funds. We have realized in revenues $3,827,741.89. We anticipate receiving $18,246,360.94. Realized through February 28, 20.98% in revenues. Our interest and in sinking funds, we have realized $6,766,715.58, which is 86.62% of our anticipated revenues. Total realized between general funds, special, special revenue funds, and interest and in sinking fund, $76,322,654.35, or 53.26% of our anticipated revenues. Our second page is our expenditures. And the expenditures is a comparison against what we have of the approved budget. Under the general fund, expenditures through February 28th is $48,490,879.23. We have $7,703,328.64 encumbered or set aside. We have spent overall the balance of 40.74%. This is a key note, just to comparison going back to the revenue. We have spent 40.74% of the budget. We have received 58% in revenues. So we still have the cash flow going, uh, less expenditures and, and more revenue. Under the special revenue funds, actual expenditures has been five million. $67,274.05. We anticipate uh, spending $18,246,360.94, 27.77%. Now, we've discussed this previously. The percent expended are actual expenditures that we actually, we have actually uh, spent out. Under the encumbrance, that money is in purchase orders or is obligated. We have, we have that, that, those purchase orders outstanding. Keynote, uh, we have put a deadline on the expenditures, and I have seen uh, in the last two weeks uh, quite a bit of increase in getting some of those uh, items uh, obligated. So we're, before we go into spring break, we are aggressively looking at expending those, or we're going to a plan B to where we're, we're uh, consolidating them and, and, and doing some purchasing with them. Under our interest and sinking funds, we have paid our February's uh, bond payment. We paid $6,467,978.13. We have a balance of $1,344,427.87, and that is consumed in August. Going off into our quarterly investment report, and this particular one we're gonna keep, I did an update and I provided that as a handout. In interest earned in first public, we have, we earned in the last three months, $131,900.87. We have invested in First Public 
$31,254,049.55. In Texas class, which is another um, uh, pool, we earn $22,730.25 in interest. Combined in the last three months, we have earned $154,631.12 of interest, and we have an ending balance of $39,226,901.14. This is a required quarterly reinvestment report that we do th every three months. Going into our tax collections, taxes collected through February 28, 2018 is $10,000,000. $508,016.10. Our tax levy is $12,987,928.21. The percent collected is 80.91% of our tax. And then we go off into our check disbursements for the month. If anyone has any questions, I will try my best to answer them. We wrote total checks of $10,000,000. $822,172.69 in the month of February. Mr. Don, I got, a, I got a quick question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, back to our investments, our investment report. Yes, sir. Um, as far as these pools are concerned, the first public and the Texas class, class pool, how many different options do we have or often do we go and check to see what our options are to where we invest our money and so on and so forth? How does that whole situation work out? Thank you. Those are those are um, those are pools that we can have as many pools as as uh, we have. Those have been historically those are the pools that San Benito has has um, are open. Um, good question is because I just came back from a uh, a Tazville meeting, which is our business office meeting, and I'm I'm looking at that right now. One of the key things is the interest rate. We go back to the investment report. It, it allows, it's the safest thing. Our money is safe in the pools. If we leave the money in our bank, it does not earn any money. So we swift, we transfer money into the pools so that we can at least earn some money. Uh, currently, I'm in talks with our bank because we are in a little, uh, we have more money in our accounts that we don't need cash flow so liquid so I'm entertaining in the idea of putting in CDs, which are higher interest rating, higher interest. There's a variety of investment that we can put out there. Uh, some have more risk, some are not. These are the safest one. Under the yield, right now it's paying, First Public is paying 0.45%. It's less than a percent, 45%. Texas Pool is a little higher, is 0.49. So um, that's something we, that we look at. Um, and. I'm going to entertain some a little bit more now that we have more money and that we don't need so much available liquid cash of doing some uh, a little higher interest yielding investments and other pools. But this is standard, more or less the pools, or this is what the running rate is. Okay, yeah, I was just, uh, and my follow up uh, statement of that was the fact is that since we're going to have an excess amount of money in our fund balance, uh, you know, I thought, you know, I just thought maybe it would be a good idea to see what our options are to see how we can ma maximize our, our, our investment. Yes, sir. Definitely. We're, uh, like I said, we talked and uh, we met CDs are paying a little 4%, so that's where we can make some of the uh, investment, long, longer term investments. Any other questions? Okay, we move on to, oh, thank you, Ms. Rendon. Thank you. As always. Thank you, sir. We move on to public comment. We actually don't have any public comments, so we'll just stri jump straight into the consent agenda. In order to promote efficient meetings, the board may act upon more than one item by a single vote to the use of consent agenda. Consent items placed on the agenda shall be marked with an asterisk. Consent items are items for which no board discussion is anticipated and for which the superintendent recommends approval. Prior to the time which approval of consent agenda is had, at the request of any member of the Board of Trustees, any item on the consent agenda shall be removed and given individual consideration. Under business and finance, one, request approval for budget amendments 2017-2018. Question? Consent? 
Number two, request approval of the TIPWEB-IT proposal from Hay Software Systems for the district-wide inventory system. Question? Consent? Number three, request for approval to purchase 60 Dell laptops and two charging carts for San Benito High School. Question? Consent? Number four, request approval of contract extension for telecommunication services, broadband circuits, and internet access. Question. Question by Mr. Mendez. Number five, request approval of the purchase of Chromebooks for elementary and middle school one-on-one -on -one initiative. Question. Consent. Number six, discussion and possible action to award CSP number 0218-ESR electrical switchboard replacement. Question. Question by Mr. Mendez. Number seven, discussion and possible action to award RFQ-0318-EAF external audit firm. Question. Question by Mr. Lopez. Number eight, discussion and possible action on revised joint election agreement between the San Benito CISD and the city of San Benito. I am questioning that one. Number nine, request for approval of Laura Lee Ortiz as early voting president or presiding judge for the May 5th, 2018 school board trustee election. Question, consent. Number 10, request for approval of Remy Garza as elections administrator, Cameron County for the May 5th, 2018 trustee election. Question. Consent. Under administration, request approval of the 2017-2018 class size waiver update. Question. Question by Mr. Mendez. Number 12, request approval of 2018-2019 school calendar. Question. Consent. Number 13, request approval of memorandum of understanding between Niños Incorporated, Children's Learning Institute's online platform, CLI Engage, and San Benito CISD. Question. Consent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Request approval of the Migrant Close-Up Program student trip to Washington, D.C. and New York City. Question. Consent. Number 15, request approval of update 110. Question. Consent. And number 16, request for approval of board minutes. Question. Consent. We move to the first question item number four. Mr. Mendez, request approval of contract extension for telecommunication services, broadband circuits. All right, correct. Can I please have a motion to approve items one, two, three, Five, nine, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. So, so moved. Moved by Mr. Mendez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Lopez. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Now we move on to the first questioned item. Uh, request for approval of contract extension for telecommunication services, broadband circuits, and internet access. Mr. Mendez. Uh, just, uh, I wanted to get a clarification on what it, uh, this particular item um, is about. Uh, is it an, an addition to what we already have, an expansion? Uh, Ms. Pena, do you wanna address that, please? It's, it's not an addition and it's not an expansion. It's the same services that we have. We're just extending the contract for another 12 month term. So it's an annual renew for? There, it's for our telecommunication internet access, our broadband circuits. Our oh. broadband circuits are actually on a three year contract and which will terminate in 2019. And then we're extending the other services for another year to match the, the expiration date. Okay, all right, thank you for the clarification. Do I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Mr. Mendez, do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Lopez, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Next question item, number six, discussion and possible action to award CSP number 0218-ESR, electrical switchboard replacement. Mr. Mendez? Yes, I believe on this one, I, we just need an, an administrative, an administration recommendation. Yes, sir. The uh, recommendation from administration is to accept the bid from Metro Electric 
Uh, their total bid, if they use all the contingency, is $123,695. Do I have a motion? So moved. Motion by Mr. Mendez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Lopez. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. On item number seven, discussion and possible action to award RFQ-0318 EAF external audit firm. Mr. Lopez. Uh, yes, sir, uh, Mr. Board President. I, uh, I recommend that we uh, table it for now. I have a motion by Mr. Lopez to table number seven. Do I have a second? Sec second by Ms. Garcia. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. On uh, number eight, discussion and possible action on revised joint election agreement between the San Benito CISD and the city of the San Benito. Based on the language, I think we need a motion to approve. Do I have? Yeah, so move. Moved by Mr. Lopez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Garcia. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. And finally, number 11, request approval of the 2017-2018 class size waiver update. Mr. Mendez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just uh, some insight on it. Can somebody provide me some insight on the uh, classroom waiver? I, I believe that I, I, I was viewing the curriculum committee meeting and, uh, and is there an increase to nine classrooms? Is that correct? That's correct. What, what's happened here is after we leveled off our campuses, <clears throat> we have a number of uh, families move in, and whether they're across the street or within two blocks, uh, we looked at the options, and we could certainly have students attend campuses that they don't uh, reside within the boundaries for. Um, however, we felt like the uh, best interest of our, of our families and our students would be uh, to let them enroll at the school that they actually move next to. Um, all these campuses have met standard, so um, we are allowed to do that. It simply requires board approval that we submit the, the waiver request to TEA. So what does that mean to our classrooms? How, how many students are actually in the classroom on a teacher-to-student to, teacher to ratio? So the largest class that we have at any uh, elementary campus is 24. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I move to approve the uh, class wa waiver. Motion by Mr. Mendez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Garcia. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Items not under consent agenda in which we need discussion and approval is number 17, request approval for allotment and TEAK certification, 2018-19. Dr. Carmen. Sir, Mr. Vargas, this is a, uh, an annual form that we complete uh, indicating that our district's technology and instructional materials allotment, materials allotment is used only for expenses allowed by uh, TEA or Texas Education Code. Um, and you can see that we've checked every grade level and every area um, that we do meet these requirements. Uh, this simply did not make it onto the agenda for the curriculum committee on time, uh, but it's an annual form the district uh, completes every year. Any questions on this item? Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Motion by Mr. Mendez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Lopez. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, on number 18, we need discussion uh, on the request approval of purchase of HVAC chiller at Oscar de la Fuente Elementary. Dr. Carmen. Uh, yes, sir. I think at this time I will ask uh, Mr. Cole, I think he's back there. Chris Cole to come forward and um, make the recommendation and answer any questions the board may have. Board members, Dr. Carmen. Uh, recommendation is going to be for uh, the purchase of a carrier chiller for Oscar de la Fuente. Uh, uh, I, I believe you all have the, the breakdown of how much everything is. Uh, the carrier just fits a little bit better with what we already have existing. 
So it's going to be the carrier chiller for that school. What's your question? Any questions for Mr. Cole? The carrier carrier corporation chiller. It's okay. The first one. It's a chiller. Oh, okay. So can I have a motion for yeah. Carrier Corporation? Can you hold on for a minute? Just oh, yes, Mr. Mendez. <laughs> I just want to look at it. <laughs> All right. I, I move to approve the uh, recommendation posed by uh, Mr. Cole. Mr. Mendez uh, has motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Lopez. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion a, carries. I want to make a comment right now, Mr. Mr. Board President, as far as our, our um, item on number six. Um, I want to commend the whole process, Mr. Cole, because back in October 3rd, I believe, at, at one of our committee meetings, in the building committee meetings, uh, Snyder presented uh, to charge us for this whole situation here with it for $230-some thousand dollars, and you came in with your process and, and due diligence and, and uh, stuff like that, and we, we, you saved the district, or the process saved the district about $100,000, so I just want to... I just want to uh, commend the people that were involved with that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole. So we move, we move on to closed meeting discussion under the authority under the authority of the Texas Government Code 551.071 for the purpose of private consultation with the board's attorney on any subjects or matters authorized by law. 551.074 for the purpose of the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee to hear complaints or charges against a public officer or employee. A, employment, resignations, and retirements. B, discussion and consideration to re-employ administrator probationary contracts. And C, discussion and consideration to renew term contracts for administrators. We convene into executive session at 8.22 p.m. We convene from executive session at 9.30 p.m. Under agenda item A, employment, resignations, and retirements, no action. Under B, uh, discussion and consideration to re-employ administrator probationary contracts, Dr. Carmen. Mr. Vargas, I would uh, ask for the board to take action on the recommendations to renew the uh, administrative contracts as presented. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Mendez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Lopez. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Agenda item C, discussion and consideration to renew term contracts for administrators. Dr. Carmen. Yes, sir. Again, I would uh, ask the uh, board to consider to um, renew and non-renew contracts as uh, discussed in executive session. So moved. Moved by Mr. Mendez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Lopez. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Can I please have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Mr. Mendez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Lopez. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. We adjourn this meeting at exactly 9.35 p.m.